Yes. Uh, what's up, everybody? Welcome to In the Booth with me, the poetess. And I'm so excited today. Um, HBO recently released The Defiant Ones and in-depth looked at the personal lives and careers of pop icons, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. And in the studio with me is a longtime friend and dope-ass movie producer um, who brought you such classics as Menace to Society, Dead Presidents, From Hell, The Book of Eli, and now the the defiant ones on hbo and i'd like to welcome my dear friend mr alan hughes thank What's you up? so much it's been too long it's been a while yeah and before we start the interview i want to tell a story about when uh from hell came out and i don't know if uh, alan remembers this but um i was working at the beat and uh you guys were on a pr campaign hmm. and you guys were they were trying to get you guys on Steve Harvey show. Oh. <laughs> and uh, apparently one of you guys said, oh, well, we got to do Poetess's show first, mm -hmm. and then we'll do Steve's show. And then everybody was like, well, damn, how does Poetess know these guys? And I say, hey, we go way mm -hmm. back, way back to when uh, you did Pac's first video, yep. uh, Brenda's Got a Baby. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted you guys to do my first video, and I fought with the record company. And it was crazy because I was on Interscope as well um, with Pac. At and that we were time. doing it. We were do I was directing the video. We were in pre-production. Do you remember that? Yes, and me and Jerry actually yeah. fell out because he would not let you guys do my first video because he – um, promised it to another director yes. but that's a long story yes. but we ended up staying friends and staying yep. in touch and and i'm just so very proud of you guys every time i see something you guys are doing i just go those are my boys yeah i i, I you have a special soft spot for you uh -huh. because uh we didn't it's, it's it's interesting in this business too it's like it happened like this with dr dre and it happened with someone else recently uh, um that i've known for a long time you go you, you you know you connect with someone, but you never work with them, mm -hmm. and you're like, we're gonna when we do when we do work together when we do work together. And me and you went down to I don't know where it was in the hood to because it was some uh, children. You were really you know you're the act, the activist in you, yes. you know. And there was some I can't my memory's bad, but we went down to the school where the kids were because we were gonna shoot the video there. Mm -hmm. So we went. All the way, like, to the 50-yard line with the music video, and someone pulled the plug on us. It yeah. was Jerry Davis. Yeah, there you go. Let's call <laughs> him out Jerry's by name. Jerry's is my boy. <laughs> Jerry, to this day, is my boy. But we fought about that. I was like, then, I won't do a video then. <laughs> and then he's like, all right. And I was like, well, I when you connect, you connect. And that was... But you guys were already a, doing yeah. such fantastic yeah. work. You did uh, Brenda's Got a Baby. I don't know. Did you guys, did you guys do Trapped? Yeah, the first video was Trapped. Yeah. We did the Tupac's first three videos on his first album. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. I was at the video shoot for Trapped. It was at some prison. Yeah. yeah that one I'm that that one that one just north of downtown on on the one ten, it's every film is shot there because it's it's, it's an old prison. Mm -hmm. uh, American Me, they shot American Me there. Oh okay. remember that Mexican film? Yes. Uh, uh that was a hardcore film. Yes. Um that was, and uh yeah. yeah, Pac, the first video we shot it was made to look like we were in Oakland or whatever, but it was shot in L.A. Yeah, yeah. I took my two little brothers there. They, they'll they never forget that because they grew up being just big Pac fans. But anyway, um, before we get into the Defiant Ones, I just kind of wanted to talk about your early, you and Albert. And how's mm -hmm. Albert doing, by he's the doing, way? He's doing great. He's finishing a film right now in uh, Europe, and uh, it's a big film. Oh, um, wow. Set 20,000 years ago, so imagine that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. what I love about you guys, that, and we'll get into that a little bit mm -hmm. uh, later. But talk about your early um, interest in making movies. I read that your mom gave you and your brother a camera, and then the rest was kind of history. <laughs> Can you talk about how you guys got interested, and were you guys interested in watching movies and, mm -hmm. and back then? We were interested like any Midwest kid would be interested because we're from Detroit. And it's not like being from L.A. or New York where, you know, uh, you would, you know, the, it, it would be natural for you to be into um, uh, uh, watching movies. So we watch movies that's just like Midwest kids that watch like, you know, like uh, Superman or whatever. We were just normal kids that like movies. We weren't like into like 
obscure movies or anything like that. So we had this dream. Any black exploitation? Back then, yeah, but not not as kids as much until we got into like 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. You know, so in Detroit, because we, we, we uh, left Detroit in 1980. We were eight. Um, and Detroit, we were just fans of the big movies that were coming out at the time, Jaws, whatever it was, you know. And um, But my mother, who's, you know, an incredible uh, – probably the most incredible person I've ever known and, and um, visionary person, activist, um, business from turn business, get, it went from uh, welfare to millionaire. You know, she used the, the welfare system the way you're supposed to use it mm-hmm. to put herself through. So a little weed in the side, because you know, it doesn't always, <laughs> <laughs> the ends don't completely <laughs> make <laughs> She was hustling, you know. Yes. And um, so she had a vision and we had a vision and we wanted to come out west. We would call it, we want to go out west because we thought it was big Hollywood dreams. You know how you are from the Midwest. You're thinking, if I go to uh, go to L.A., you just bump into Michael Jackson. You just think that's going to happen or whatever. Yeah. So uh, t- as it turns out, her family, uh, uh, some of her family was out here. And we had this dream. We all had this dream. And she saw it. She knew there was something about um, me and my, bro- my brother and I, like, in this entertainment, we were fascinated with movies. Well, we thought we were going to be in front of the camera. We thought we were entertainers. And boy, when we got out here and st- got an agent and got our big ass <laughs> noses and, and uh, awkward asses in front of a first uh, 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 audition, it was terrible. And uh, we we sat for a few commercials though. You know, we got paid one with Gary Coleman and whatever. We weren't in them. They just had us waiting. You know. Um, cause we were terrible and we had these big ass noses. Can we curse on this radio <laughs> yes. show? Like with the F and everything. Yeah, everything. Uh, okay. And, um. It's my shit. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll try to make a long story short. It's in my motherfucking shit. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll make a long story long. What happened was in, we would always do, I mean, we were always creating little things or whatever, but around 82, 83, 84, we all know what happened in in L.A. and the outskirts of L.A., the crack epidemic was right. so hard. And we were in an, in an impoverished area, if you if you will. And you were teens, yeah. impressionable. Pre, like right pre-teen, yeah, yes. like 12. Right at 12, my mom um, was wise enough to, um, to see that, you know, hey, there's all this stuff going on outside, gang-banging, crack dealing, and, and my kids go outside. And what are they interested in? So back then there were video stores, you know, like when they had mom and pop, you go rent the videos and mm-hmm. movies. But they would also rent you, a, a, you can rent a camera. And one day she rented us a camera and, and brought it home for us. And uh, Albert and I, for 24 hours straight, shot films, like 12 of them. Whether, whether they were uh, uh, comedies, whether they were little, um, like, in search of with Leonard Nimoy, like knockoffs of that show or knockoffs of this and knockoffs of that. We didn't do what most kids do, which is go sh- get our BMX or our skateboards and do skateboard videos. We went right to making movies. We made a, our first time we rolled camera was a sci-fi film. Did you and get all the kids in the neighborhood to participate? Not that How first that that first twenty four hours. Mm-hmm. It was just me and him. Uh huh. And then then she did something even smarter. Um, I don't know how much whatever but she bought a camera for her business her company she goes this is my camera but you guys can use it Mm -hmm. that's when that's when we started involving the whole neighborhood wow that's amazing um and you guys after you did your home movies so to Mm -hmm. speak you started doing music videos right we started doing me well first happened was uh, uh in high school you remember when local public access came out where people can go and rent time on and TV. rent time yeah. on tv in their local community and yes. there's a channel well in in our community there was and we had state-of-the-art equipment too so that was the first time we had access to editing equipment we were 15 16 i had five shows on cable i had a talk show where i was like Geraldo rivera i had my uh, as the talk <laughs> wow. show i had a show called i can't remember what it was god I'm, i had a show like in living color before in living color with the clown and everything I mean, before in Living Color. Okay. I had, we would do features. Comedy skits. Comedy skits, yeah, sketch comedy, mm-hmm. yeah. And we had, we would, uh, I would do one feature, and then I had a homeboy, uh, my, my, my white homeboy, who'd like to do that little stop animation with the claymation. Mm-hmm. And so I would produce and 
his show as well. So I had five shows on cable by the time I was 16. Did you record any of them? Oh, they're out there. And that, that very cable network in Claremont, California, mm-hmm. they still run them every now and then just to get sexy, you know. What? <laughs> to, to keep us humble. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so how were you able to, and then after that step, and then when you started doing music videos, how did you, um, I'm sure you had a vision, okay, I'm doing, we're doing music videos, but we're going to eventually do something bigger. So how were you able to transition from doing music videos to movies, like yeah. major studio movies? I think that, you know, uh, when, I, when I think back at, the, the the dream was to make movies it was the dream was not to make music videos but at the time when you remember in 1988 this is before we're out of high school you know you you, you know what was happening with the OMTV raps and eventually with uh, pump it up uh, on Fox with D Barnes you're seeing back then the, the the hip-hop they were telling they were saying something so those videos were hella visual uh, whether it was public enemy whether it was um, uh, all that stuff off the Ruthless Records with the NWA and the DOC. I remember that Funky Enough video when I saw that. I said, who the fuck is this? Mm-hmm. And it, how visual and dope and how dope he was, you know. But there was there was a lot of that back then. It wasn't like just two people. There was like ten dope artists, you know, not like now where it's like one, you know, <laughs> that people pay attention to. Yeah, it was more to. of a variety. To yeah, it was a from. lot of variety, you yeah. know, and the... It was uh, hip hop was eclectic. Yes, you know, it wasn't just gangster rap. And, and then even yeah. when you guys started doing your music videos, mm-hmm. they were like dramatic, like mm-hmm. Brenda's Got a Baby mm-hmm. and Trap. They were like almost like movies. Yeah, that's what. Because our first music video, we went up to Oakland, and how I met Tupac because we went up to Oakland because our first music, our first break came. We had done some shorts. Albert had went to L.A. Community College uh, for one year. Got his hands on some. The first time we, we were doing video. This was film now, Super 8 film. Did you it. have any training or no, education never, never. before getting no, into film? No. Self-taught. Self-taught. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and when you have a twin, the, the learning is accelerated, mm. you know, because you have a built-in brain trust, you know. Wow. And you're just challenging each other all the time. And by the way, I, ne- I didn't realize until recently when you have a twin, you wake up working and you go to bed working. It's not stop. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just chopping everything up you know so uh where were we we were you were talking <laughs> about uh albert was going to LA oh, uh, yeah community college yeah. and we, you were doing videos uh you went to oakland that was the, the moment when, when we put our hand when we got our hands on film for the first time and mind you it was called super eight the the home version of film not mm-hmm. the movie version 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter which is going to be lost on a lot of people i'm not really a technical person mm-hmm. but super eight is but fit. albert was is more he, the technical he's guy. more the technical guy right okay he brought home the super eight film i was i still had a job i, w- I always had jobs you know mm-hmm. and um he brought home this and we made our first film was called menace to society it had nothing to do with menace to society mm-hmm. um it was uh, anyway it was a, it was a little short and i won't get into it, it was a little violent um, black and white and then our, our, our second uh, short and these were Alberts really because he's at college so I can't mm-hmm. it can't be the Hughes there mm-hmm. were no Hughes brothers we mm-hmm. weren't known we were known mm-hmm. as the twins or the brothers or the guys or so um, uh, w- the, the films would have it was directed by Albert uh, even though we both made them you know and so our second one was called the drive-by that was five minutes six minutes about a drive-by um, and what happened was those two films and a woman named Tamara Davis changed our lives. Tamara Davis, who directed It's Getting Funky by DOC, that video. So she was she was with Delicious Vinyl? She was, yeah, Is she, was, she was embedded with them pretty as friends, you know. Oh, okay. Because she had done the Tone Lo Wild uh, thing video. Okay, and so I she was she, a video director. She was a video director at the time. Uh-huh. She wanted to become a, a movie director. Mm-hmm. And her and Mike D eventually got married from the Beastie Boys and had children. So, But Tamara was like a, a pioneering, like... Uh, visionary director and in in hip-hop music videos you mm-hmm. know so she got our shorts through at the time a, a guy by the name of nelson george whoever mm-hmm. I think everyone knows and um uh the hudlin brothers i can go on and on like and carly from uh, jive records like they, they, people have been getting through tamra had seen these shorts and and then finally i i uh, i figured out a way um 
there was two music videos from a group called Raw Fusion, which was a spinoff of Digital Underground. Yeah, so Money B and um, they, DJ Fuse. DJ Fuse, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Both like, and it was an incredible record. Uh, it was her first record. And we had to go up to Oakland and meet with Digital Underground because that's who they are. Mm-hmm. And so we, we met at a Waffle House, Money B and DJ Fuse and Shock G and on and on and on. And there was, I'm sorry, and there was another guy at the table who I just was immediately captivated by. And uh, I didn't, I was so excited we're gonna shoot our first music video, we were 19 the the next day. This is our first like real creative meeting with the guys. And it's all a digital underground, but this one guy in particular, I'm like, who the fuck is this, this? And he was hilarious. He was so funny and so charismatic and, he had me on the ground, so I went up to go, go uh, to the restroom, and he came in to go to the restroom, and this guy said to me, "I just signed a, a record deal, and my label's on my dick, and I saw y'all films. You, you motherfuckers are dope. I'm getting you guys to direct my first music video." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, whatever. Dude. I just met you. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> like, I'm here for these guys, but all right." And then the next day, when we showed up, and I asked him, "I go, you gonna be at the music video tomorrow?" this guy that was there mm-hmm. and um and he said you know absolutely and the next day um i got to the music our first music video up in oakland actually we were in richmond for or we were oakland and richmond on that one and shock g's there everyone's there we're getting ready to shoot this intro like you know when you used to do in- intros to music mm-hmm, videos mm-hmm. and i kept going where's tupac <laughs> i'm not starting to tupac gets here and everyone was like why are you waiting for time I'm, I'm waiting for this guy now because i and I, I i just knew and it, this is Money B's video. Mm-hmm. And I, we waited for Tupac. And then I, once he got there, I put him right in the middle. And then we started the sketch. And he was front and center. And I just knew the dude was a rock star, you know. Yes. And by the way, Money B delivered. And it was a great video. It went on to um, win a, a best debut video. I found this out years I later on BET. You, and, your first video was mine. And, uh, oh, man. And DJ Fees. And Money B is who put me on my favorite rapper of all time when, when his name was Action. Um he put me on Scarface. Oh, wow. I didn't know who Scarface was. And wow. then Tupac further doubled down on Tupac. People don't know. Like, I that was his number one uh, rap artist of all to him. Scarface was number one. Oh wow! And people don't know that. Yeah. I didn't. Um, I did want to bring up Pac, and I don't want to um, rehash a bunch of stuff that See, happened. I'm long winded. I'm long winded. No, Where's the clock? I, because okay. it, it's already <laughs> been said. I mean, you've already addressed a lot of things mm-hmm. and and well i watched the one you did with sway yeah and um but had Pac lived till now in this era mm-hmm. of social media and mm-hmm. twitter and instagram and where do you think Pac would be like right now do you think he would have evolved do you think that wisdom would have mm-hmm. kicked in and he would have denounced that whole uh thug life mm-hmm. persona what, what do you think that's a great question, I, and um, I'm going to say something really provocative, but it's true. Denzel Washington would not have the career he has if Tupac were alive. Wow. Period. Why would you say that? The thing that made Tupac so special is there's only one other person in modern history that we know of that had this power that he has, and it was Muhammad Ali that had that much charisma that could move the world like that. And that's what made Pac different than, because listen, I love a lot of his music. And then some of his, his rhymes are, you know, when I say rhymes, I use that term, term mm-hmm. loosely. Like he wasn't, when you lyric for lyric, the greatest rapper alive, he was the greatest rock star that r- rap ever produced. He had, he was the full package, yes. you know? And so he was just getting into movies and you can see he, he had it, but he hadn't worked with any real filmmakers. You know, I mean, I'm I'm sorry if I if I, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. You know, like he worked with some decent directors and whatever. Don't get me wrong. You know, maybe directors that weren't able to bring out. Yeah, that's a better the way best to put it. Let's be him. more. Let's maybe be a little more political. <laughs> he hadn't. If he had lived, he would still be rapping. Doing movies. He would still well, be. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. But I, I he, Denzel would not have been able to do what he was eventually able to do he, as great as Denzel is wow. uh, with Tupac here. That's big. And yeah. you worked with Denzel. Yeah. So. And Denzel is special. Yes. I mean, he's special, special. So mm. I'm not, I'm not even shitting on Denzel. Like that man is got it. You know? And, and 
you guys had um, an incident back in uh, in the '90s where mm-hmm. you ended up pressing charges on Pac mm-hmm. for an incident that happened before Pac died. What were what was your relationship? Did you guys ever patch things up? Mm-hmm. If not, would you think by now you guys would have oh, it was, worked it, together? Yeah. We definitely would have worked together uh, because before he passed, um, he in Vibe magazine, one of his last interviews, he said, I, I want to apologize to two people. And he apologized to Quincy Jones mm-hmm. for those disparaging remarks he made about a black man putting his dick in white women. <laughs> Even pa- Meanwhile, Pox pa- fucking pa- white pa- girls <laughs> you know, <laughs> in Miami with, my, uh, with Madonna and shit just <laughs> right. standing there magic. You know, so, and she just came out talking about yeah. he broke up with her because she was white. Or exactly. Stop messing with no, her or whatever. That's true. Yeah. And he understood that that wasn't going to fly with, mm-hmm. his, with his fan base, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's nothing against like doing dating whoever you want to love or whoever you whatever. But um, the question was he apologized to, and then to he, Quincy, Quincy and Jones, and then he apologized to, to to my brother and I for what he did in print. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, that's the that's the first big step. And and then an interesting thing happened because I was feeling I was like, we were definitely going to work together. That that was the goal for Tupac and the Hughes brothers was to do a film from the beginning you know and when he apologized a funny little thing happened on the way to the bank i was i had a i had a i had a record deal at that point with jimmy ivy and interscope to do soundtracks and to sign artists and he would use me like an a and r guy as mm-hmm. well so he would play me he would always play he plays everyone tracks so he played me this track before it came out like a month before it came out the track was called hit em up and he played it for me that. and he says what do you think because Pac had now just been released from prison now this is he's on death row you know what that was but Jimmy Ivey played me hit him up for the first time before it came out I said he kept saying what do you think I said I think Tupac and or Suge will be dead in less than six months and Jimmy said why do you say that why are you saying that I, and I didn't know why I was saying it I just could hear on the record where he was and I could, I could feel that we had never been there before, and it was dangerous, and it was scary. Because one thing about Tupac that people don't really talk about is that he could talk shit well. Like, he was the best. Fuck the rap on Hit Him Up. It was when he was popping shit in between at the end and whatever. And so that's a long-winded way of me saying, and four months later, he was dead. Wow. Yeah, he, yeah that, that whole time was... And and because he had been shot before that that last time you, you we thought that he would was gonna make it. In fact, um, when the Tupac movie came out, they did the whole House of Blues scene, and I actually hosted that event wow. that night. So I hosted wow. Pac's last concert. But who How you would never was think that, that that would be the last time you would see Pac. But how incredible we, was that show, though? That show was <laughs> off. The like, chain. It's and it's historical. And it's crazy yeah. because I I was the first female rapper on Interscope mm. and we were on our way out when Death Row was coming in and I had made the domestic violence song uh, Love Hurts mm-hmm. that was mm-hmm. inspired by the whole Dr. Dre uh, D incident. Right. And so uh, one day Suge came up there looking for me. I didn't know who Suge was. And they was like, he was like, where's that fat white bitch at? <laughs> <laughs> Shook up our whole office. <laughs> and when I came in shortly after, they was like, Suge was up here looking for you. I was like, well, who is Suge? <laughs> Everyone didn't know And Shug. then several months later, I met Suge. And he was like, oh, man, I love your voice on the radio. And he gave me $500 in cash to host the House of Blues gig. And I was like wow. saying to myself, does he know I'm the same poetess wow. <laughs> that he came up there looking for one day? So I'm sure he did. He just is a nut. <laughs> <laughs> he can well, compartmentalize well, this we'll shit. Well, we see that. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an interesting story. Okay, so um, now, mm. fast forward to now. We're going to get back into the filmmaking. There's like, uh, what are your thoughts on today's filmmaking techniques? I'm sure editing films is a lot easier because you guys were actually editing tape back then now you have digital and then a lot of these people are making movies off of their iPhones Mm -hmm. I mean what do you think of all of that Mm -hmm. 
I think it's great that you can do you can literally like that uh, documentary Searching for Sugarman. Uh, you know, we're told most of it was shot in the iPhone. That one went on to win an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. So the, the the artist in you, even when I was in my 20s, you get a little uh, uh, anxious and threatened by it. Like, oh, my God, all this this technology, I'm not going to have a job because everyone's going to be able to do it. And then you go, hey, 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 calm down. There was this been fucking guitars for like oh, hundreds of years, you know, and there's been, um, what do you call it, like brass instruments mm -hmm. for hundreds of years and strings and that that doesn't mean there was you know a great artists got put out of business so the cream rises to the top and i think it's great that there's, there, there's you can literally make a great movie on your phone mm. if you want to mm. and but most people don't yeah well yeah. I, a lot of these music people a lot of these uh young artists that are uh recording artists now are definitely making their own videos music videos yeah. Very like creative that. stuff, too. Yeah. Very creative stuff. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Now, um, how do you feel the Internet and online web series changed the game, in your opinion, with the success of series such as Insecure mm -hmm. and, and, and some of these web series are going off to get network deals? So what do you think of that? Because a lot it, of people yeah. still look yeah. down on, I don't want my stuff on YouTube or the Internet. or Some people don't um, get doing a web series and, and growing it independently yeah. with grassroots. All I have to say is they, there's a lot of examples we can use. You're well, a lot more well-versed in that than me. But look over to what Snoop did with GGN. And they started doing that as a hobby, uh, his little talk show. Uh, you know, he kept it hood, but it still has this kind of gloss to it, but it's hood. Mm -hmm. um, he's smoking weed. You know, he's <laughs> doing his thing. They started that as, like, just a hobby like three four years ago he's getting ready to turn that into a multi you know I'm, i was getting ready to say billion I, I think snoop will be a billionaire um but that empire of his is growing from that little show web series show on youtube that no one paid him for yeah and he has advertisers now i yeah. mean got you people know. yeah and i know some stuff i can't can't reveal mm -hmm. about some of his business right now mm -hmm. uh, because we're getting ready to do something together. Mm -hmm. And this guy got his shit together. First of all, he got his shit together. He he didn't have to like uh, so many other people when that when he when that when he went up for that murder trial and he got off and you saw him pray, thank God when they said not guilty. He stayed on a straight and narrow. That guy. It took a while for him to get his business together, but it came from what you're saying. It came from what do you call it? Web I don't know web series web series whatever like he built he built it just like you he's building it from the ground up and there's so much value it, it first of all it's like dope you know it, it, any great art or any great personality I think uh, um, is like is like who has the purest cocaine right and if you got great cocaine and you s give free samples out you don't have to talk much either people are gonna come back mm -hmm. they're always gonna come back for the real dope you know and 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 then you can start monetizing it. Yeah, it's just that simple. Yeah, it's, a, it's an age-old, you know, fundamental thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I hate to use the dope references, but I always have to. <laughs> I always, um, I, my analogy, it's almost like the independent rap game. Mm -hmm. You got to get out there. You got to promote it. You got to get it in people's faces and. And in nowadays, you really don't need the big record label. You just mm -hmm. got to be willing to work. Marketing is key now because everything is online. So, you you know, your money is going toward marketing the content. Yeah. So. Um, but if it my, my thing has always been if it's if, if, you, if you could find an easy E taught me this in, in his actions, because I was with him for a whole summer. It, Wasn't you, he a beautiful guy and mis oh, totally was, misunderstood? Oh, my God. I, this guy was – his name wasn't easy for for no reason. Yeah. So laid back, so gracious. He taught me I, – I saw the way he dealt with fans when they would come up. He did this little thing he would do. They would go, can we have a picture? Can we have a picture? And um, he'd go, yeah, take a picture. And he always go, take another one. <laughs> you know, take another one. And it, But Easy taught me something my mother started with, which is – Find out what makes you special and identify that and then leverage and market the fuck out of that and you're going to thrive, you know. And Easy taught me that, you know, not what his words, but what his actions. 
Yes, you know? yes. And one one thing about Easy is that he could never say no. People would ask him <laughs> yeah. for stuff, and That's he would true. just say, okay, yeah, just hit me up later. <laughs> he was but he always, would just never said no. <laughs> but to your point, you know, one thing, uh, uh, he, to what you're saying right now is that, and I'm connecting to it, he stayed in touch with, and I hate to use it, he stayed in touch with the streets. He stayed, he would go to the radio stations, he'd go to the parks, he'd go to the, you know, whatever, where they have an events, and he would pop his trunk open, even when he was successful, and have CDs and tapes, and he stayed in with the people, you know, did, and the marketing did. was with the people. Yes. You know? yeah, yeah, he did, and his parents, I believe, still have that little house in Compton oh, wow. that he grew up in wow. but Easy did a lot I mean he took a lot of kids out of Compton school get a school bus took them all to Disneyland mm-hmm, yeah. I mean he, he used to do a lot of great things help put everybody in the studio who wanted to rap I mean he, he really was a, a great guy I, they need to do actually an unsung on Easy. Yeah, <laughs> they need. you know what you, you know, I you mean just they gave did me a, straight out of Compton you just but, gave me an idea you know it would be a great documentary like how because he such a character just a great oh, you know character funny funny as shit yes i remember it's one time we had a, a birthday party for my best friend sheena lester we lived in um silver lake and easy came this is actually five months before he died oh wow came to the house he had a big ass bag of weed you know mm-hmm. supplied the whole party and sat out in his ch- uh, jeep cherokee and played his upcoming album that he had been working on and just he was just he walked, he sat with people, he invited people out to the Jeeps to listen to the music. He was just such just such a good guy. In this a, a unique. Uh, and he was on the beat, on the radio. Yeah. He had his own Ruthless Radio. Really? And he would give out his own prizes. They would be like Jordans, <laughs> uh, video games. He did. Oh, he uh, he did his own he thing when it. he was at, at, at the radio station with Julio G. So yeah, rest in peace, it. easy. Yeah. I know we're a little limited on time, so I'm going to get through uh, a couple more questions. Um, no, we're not. What time is it now? <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you avoid getting caught up because you guys have done a few genres of movies how did you avoid getting caught up in doing so-called just black movies i mean because you guys have done um from hell book of eli broken city i mean so how did you guys avoid getting caught up in that trap it's just recognizing from day one one thing that hurt me about menace um if you think back and let's just really break this down um because I've had uh, uh, people close to me talk about, bring this out of me recently, I didn't realize this. Now, Menace, when it came out, was the most critically acclaimed film that year. Uh, it was on every critic's top ten list. Uh, at the MTV Movie Awards, we were up against Schindler's List, mm. Philadelphia, The Fugitive, um, and Jurassic Park. And there was Menace. And I wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to go. And they had to tell me that we pretty much won. That was a People's Choice Award, mm. okay? And what happened was the critics loved it. Um, and I didn't think about this to two years ago. Someone brought it up to me. You know, there was no nominations. There were no anything on Menace, right? A lot of a lot of black people were very upset by that. You know, not one academy, nothing. It's unheard of, right? There was this thing that was happening that, although the business was celebrating, my brother and I and the film and the filmmaking and the quality and whatever, but they had this thing that they do with all black people. They go, they had to have experienced that for it to be this good. And that was the that was the thing that no one talked about. That the boys, the white boys club, that was what they were they they were revering us. But they also were putting us in the nigga column. Like mm-hmm. these niggas got shot. They know <laughs> their mother was probably dealing crack or their father's a junk, whatever the fuck it is, you know. Mm-hmm. And so they assume that as black people. In order for us to be great at something, we had to actually live through it. We can't go do what Spielberg did with E.T. and not know of fucking, <laughs> you know. Alien. Alien. <laughs> and so it, it, I remember, I didn't care about it. I didn't even realize about the account. I didn't care about that show. I didn't know at that time. Um, but I do remember going, you know what? One thing about I love about Oprah, um, there's a few things I love about Oprah, but I was never a big Oprah f- like fan of mm-hmm. the show. But mm-hmm. I've since become fan of Oprah the woman Mm -hmm. you know I've always been a fan of Oprah the woman she would she was not about to go out as the best black talk show host of all time 
She's about to go out as the greatest talk show host of all time, period, and then the greatest businesswoman of all time. Not the greatest black businesswoman of all time. And she taught me, just as my mother had taught me, like, fuck that shit. You're not, I'm not about to be the best black nothing. I'm mm-hmm. about to be the best. Period. Period. Mm-hmm. And so that was right after uh, we did Dead Presidents. I said, you know what? I'm going left. And we're going to London. <laughs> Do some Jack the Ripper shit. Still hood. You know, it's still the hood. And, but, and then I continued to think that way. Um, but it wasn't too with the, right now with the defiant ones where I feel like I finally come into myself where I'm like, all right, this is it. You see this magic of black and white that you look at the defiant ones, it's black and white. It's a gangster party. Everyone's invited to, we're all celebrating each other's greatness. No one's feeling uncool. The white boy's not feeling uncool. The little black boy's not feeling uncool. The black girl, like everyone has something in their culture that's fucking unique and cool and we all got to celebrate it in this film the defiant ones you know yes and i want to get into that i mean that documentary was such an inspiration and to when especially when he was talking about the early days of interscope because Mm -hmm. i i was around that time and it just brought up so many memories and just to see i almost got the impression that um jimmy iovine kind of faked it until he made it exactly. kind of thing when he was in the studio <laughs> not really not really an engineer but just playing with some knobs and and just came when it was the time to come it was him coming in on yeah. easter like some people ah oh, it's a holiday i'm not and you know and I, I didn't know that Jimmy was Italian. That was another No thing. one did. Because he yeah. looks like um, Iranian, you know, like yeah. Middle Eastern or something. And then but with that name, you think maybe Jewish, you know. Yeah, I but. Mean, you think Jewish. Yeah, but know. when I was at Interscope, my go-to person was Ted Field. So yeah. it was kind of cool to wow. see um, Ted Big in boss. there. Yeah. Yes, Ted. And, and I was with um, in touch with Ted um, just recently. So mm. it was good to just kind of see that. But I wanted to ask you, in terms of the Defiant Ones, um, we know that relationships are a vital part of succeeding in this entertainment mm-hmm. business. I always say it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, what do you think it was uh, about I like you? One. I like that one. I never heard that one. Is that yours? <laughs> I've heard it before, yeah. but I know that that's the truth. Yeah. People could say they know you all day, but uh, you know someone all day, but do they know you? you. Yeah. So. Um, what, what, what do you think it was about you that Jimmy and Dre trusted one to mm-hmm. do a project like this and open up? Cause mm-hmm. there was some things, there was a lot of things we learned in the defiant ones. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, uh, I've known both men over 25 years independent of one another and before they met one another. Uh, so there was, um, a built in, um, history there, uh, and relationship and they knew me to your point mm-hmm. and I knew them you know and um I had worked with Jimmy before uh and me and Dre had tried to work up until that point it was 22 years I'd known him when we started this or 21 years we had tried to work together several times and we'd come literally in the rooms about projects or videos and then one of us would walk out of the room you know not not uh, upset just it wasn't right mm-hmm. and um and I think what was gained through that process with Dre and Jimmy is that they understood um, something about me that Dre has, which is he's very selective, and he's not going to do anything for money. Dre's not going to do it for the money. No, uh, I, I think most true artists don't. No, they don't. Yeah. yeah. And they knew that. I didn't know that. They knew that about me. Mm-hmm. They knew things about me that I didn't know when I started this project. You know, and, and sometimes I feel like, guys, don't worry, I'm going to make sure. They're like, we know you, Alan. Why are you, why are you tripping? We know, we know who you are. I'm right. like, what are they talking about? Yeah, they probably did, they did a whole background check. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't have to. I lived, no. I, lived in, I lived in the Interscope offices for four years. Yeah, I well, you said you did some A&R. You had a label over yeah, there. So. Yeah, from 96 to 92,000 almost, you know. Yeah. And, um, and before that, my first music, first music videos, we did, uh, you know, with Tupac. So we were born out of the Interscope system. Mm-hmm. And, and the Dr. Dre side, I'd been known him since I was 19. He introduced me to Easy e mm. So I think that they were, they're a lot more clever and wise than I am. And they know things that I don't know. And they knew that it was my idea to do this thing. 
Uh, in fact, no, actually, it was Dre's curiosity about his life because it was going to be a Dre film or documentary first, way before Straight Outta Compton. Mm -hmm. And he and I had done the I Need a Doctor video with Eminem. And he said, to, he, he, in an innocent, modest way, he said, do you think my life is it? interesting because i made it, it the video like a retrospective on his life and i made him made it so he paid homage to easy at the end he went to easy's gravesite mm -hmm. that was the first time dre had ever been there oh wow and um he said do you think we were in his kitchen one day you think my life would make an interesting story i said would it you lived the life of like 10 men so we struck out to make a film or a television show or a we didn't know on his life and it was uh and that's how it started and then one day i called hbo I said, what if I told you I can get the most enigmatic hip-hop artist of all time to open up and talk about his life? And they said, who? I said, Dr. Dre. They said, green light. I never even heard of green light ever in my life, <laughs> let alone over the phone. And they said, one problem. We just green lit Jimmy Iovine's Interscope documentary. Not about Jimmy, about Interscope. Just now with Jimmy. I said, I'll call you back. Because <laughs> I went, bing, I got it. This is 2012. Beats was like the Michael, jo you know, Air Jordan's apple of, you know, accessories, you know, at that time. They were just, they had just erupted the 2012 Olympics. I said, I know the stories and to do both their stories together as a documentary. And um, I just, it was, ma it was a magical moment to come like to that. it was like almost, and I'm doing the, the this, where yeah. their lives intersect. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. how they were all, it was well, very well put together. Hats mm -hmm. off to you on oh, that. Thank you. And um, what was my other question about that? Um, in the Defiant Ones, you touched on the whole Dre D. Barnes situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it's never been touched on mm -hmm. before. It's always been kind of swept on. People have not really wanted to like address Dre about mm -hmm. that. I did before him and I sat down and had a private one-on-one -on -one conversation about that whole incident. Mm -hmm. But to actually get D side and hear what she had to say, do you think, uh, did you have to clear that with Dre first and say, hey, I want to address this. How do you feel about it? Was, it, was he cool? Did it make mm -hmm. him feel a little uncomfortable? How mm -hmm. was that? He's definitely uncomfortable. Uh, um, and you see that in the film, and and I think it's the beauty of it is there's no lying there. Um, but to his credit, um, when Jimmy Iovine and Andre Young, Dr. Dre, and I sat down for our first meeting to talk about what we were going to do, that's the number one thing he brought up. I got to deal with this. This is before Straight Outta Compton, mm -hmm. way before Straight Outta Compton mm -hmm. was even a film or green lit. And so he's he's no dummy. You know, he knew what this was, and and this is before D wrote the Gawker piece, and it blew back up in his face because of the Straight Outta Compton thing. So it was unfortunate because you're making a documentary, and when you're making a real documentary, it takes years. So it doesn't matter what work you put in. People don't know what work you're putting in. And it was unfortunate at the time because uh, what, what, D was making a great point, you know, because she didn't know uh, because I couldn't tell her because I didn't want to compromise her interview. It, I didn't know if she was going to do an interview. And that was more important to me. What was more important than uh, an apology was to get D to be a part of the family that she was and give her the platform to be her and have her voice because she had that voice and she is a special individual and she was also a hip hop artist and and is a hip hop artist and a journalist and a, you know, and so it was important for me. The incident's one thing, but it was important important for me that she be baked into our narrative, as part of the celebration of what the culture was because that's what she was in the culture, mm -hmm. and more important than the incident or the apology, first was that. But I didn't know whether she would do it or not, and so when we <coughs> did meet, I was so taken with her because I had never met her before. And I was like, I had seen, I just was, I was like, this, her spirit is incredible. Uh, her sense of humor, her intellect, her activism, you know, and Dre was with it. You know, Dre, I'll reveal this for the first time on this show. The thing that Dre and D said independent of one another, but they had in common is they were willing to come together on film and make amends. 
and really have you film because it. I actually yeah. talked to D mm -hmm. about a week ago. I told her I was mm -hmm. going to be interviewing you. What's and up, D? <laughs> she says that her and Dre have never sat down mm -hmm. since this incident mm -hmm. and that she would be willing yeah. to do that. Yeah. So I would like to see, not even necessarily, maybe on film, but more on a personable yeah. level level because a lot of people don't know how that incident really affected Dee's life. Yeah. I mean it it I was I was there that mm -hmm. night that that happened and mm -hmm. I've been her friend years after yeah. that and I've seen up close in person how that yeah. um affected her life and I've and Dre's cool too. I love Dre too mm -hmm. cuz we've always had a good respect for each other and him and I sat down and had a private yeah. Uh, serious conversation about it. So what I would like to see, just for some healing yes. purposes, is that them two get together and yeah. spend time together. Absolutely. Because before that happened, yeah. Dre, D, um, D used to be in a rap group called Body and Soul, mm -hmm. and Dre was seeing um, D's partner. Mm -hmm. And we were all, we all hung out. We were all family. And for that to happen, yeah. it just kind of uh, blew us away. But I know that Dre... Um, feel some kind of way about that, and I just hope no, to he, see he, one he, day he's, that they. He's, he's. I can't speak for Dre. I can only speak for what I feel, and he's there. You know, he he's definitely there, and she's there. I think the first big step is in is is what just happened in the Defiant Ones. That's a big step for both of them, and she was the one that took the big step. You know, and her the power of what she did has changed his life. Trust me. Yeah. And they and they will. They they will sit. That was the, the one thing I want to underscore here was I was not about to film that because that's not my business. Yeah. And they both wanted to do it though. Just let's be clear. Oh, they wonderful. Both wanted well, to well do that's it. a good thing yeah. because I I've, I've always wanted to see them them two get together. So um, a couple questions on current events before <laughs> we wrap up. Um, what are what are your thoughts on this whole Charlottesville? protest oh wow yeah do you think what do you think of the world right now in you're this great age we, gotta, of we Trump? gotta get you on network television <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got you got great questions what was it what was the, the charlottesville uh, protest and trump's reaction to it i mean what do you do well, trunk's tr listen, trunk <laughs> trunk trunk yeah, it's the it's just a, he's a punk bitch i don't even i'm not gonna waste my words on him mm -hmm. because it's just obvious what that piece of shit is mm -hmm. okay but we let me just say this: you, you are what you eat, you know, and we deserve Trump as a nation because of our our education system brought us Trump and the Internet, by the way, on top of that social media and the lack of education and our never focusing on education. So you are what you eat and uh, America eats its young. And uh, I'm not going to blame Trump. I'm going to get ready to go. Something. What, what's the Charlottesville? What's it called? Uh, protest. I fucked it. I always the, uh, the, 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 the alt left, okay. uh, let's alt talk right, about, whatever let's these talk people about, are. Let's talk about something we should be talking about, which is the, the question you asked. Because to me, like I said, Trump is a symptom of our problem. Fuck Trump. Mm -hmm. He's not our problem. He's a symptom of our problem. So I wouldn't waste any time talking about it. He's a worthless human being. I'll be glad okay. when he's gone. He's a worthless human being, literally. Yes. When you look at what just happened in... Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. I was up that morning, the night, the morning after the candle, the candles, the fuck. First of all, what the, when did the KKK start fucking with tiki <laughs> torches? Yeah, I mean that's some punk bitch shit in itself, right? It's sexy in Hawaii. Don't get me wrong. It's sexy in the islands, the Bahamas, and whatever. Not with some white. Anyway, so the next morning I'm watching this shit on television, and I'm seeing what's happening at nine, ten a.m. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm in bed because I hadn't slept. And I said to myself, I said, turn the TV off. Someone's about to get killed. Okay, I can just feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was going to be worse than it was. Mm -hmm. But here's the point I want to make. Here's again, you know, you are what you eat. This whole thing about the media and what the media does and how they play a role in the East Coast, West Coast rivalry, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, check this out. Guess what? You can't gather up a hundred thousand white supremacist in America right now because there isn't. You can gather up a couple thousand at best. I'm literally like, at best, you're going to gather up at, I'm talking about hardcore, racist guys that want to get active. Maybe 20,000, maybe 50,000. 
that's not shit. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about that. Mm-hmm. It looks like our country's being whatever because they hijacked the Republican Party through this fucking bozo, right? But one thing I think we should all take a collective side. Of, here's what Trump is to me. Trump is a bad case of food poisoning for us. And we need it. You know what happens after you get food poisoning. Diarrhea. <laughs> Diarrhea. <laughs> but your system adjust. You learn to appreciate, like, man, I should be eating more broccoli. I shouldn't be eating at McDonald's. Like, so your system needed that for you to go to appreciate your organs and, your, you know, and your brain and your health and whatever. And I think we we stopped appreciating our institutions and the liberties we have, you know. And we look up at this thing that just happened and we are convinced that this is really a problem. It's only a problem because we there's not that many of these hardcore white motherfuckers like this. Literally, there's not. I mean, in 1988, there were 70,000 gang members in Los Angeles. Hardcore Mexican and black so gang. So you saying there's more gang bangers than uh, white supremacists? Hundred percent. So if they want to get it popping, just say the word, because <laughs> motherfuckers from Chicago, L.A., Atlanta, Miami, I can keep going. We'll descend on you and uh, you know euthanize you know, your whole shit. We can stop killing each other. But we don't want to do that. I'm saying you, we don't want that. But mm-hmm. I'm saying if you want to crunch the numbers right now, yeah, there's not a problem. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a yeah. problem. Yeah, just let. Uh, Listen, I'm getting real ill right now. If we really want to, uh, 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 if, if they really want that, just make one phone call to Chicago and organize those kids. And that's a wrap. You guys mm-hmm. are done. Yeah. You're done. Yeah. So it's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. And um, <laughs> one last. Uh, that sounded nuts. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> no, no, no. This is what it is. Um, also, Colin Kaepernick um, mm-hmm. and people talking about boycotting the NFL. What do you think about Colin's uh, stance on everything? Do you think he sacrificed? Do you think a lot of there's it's it's split? Yeah, I got mixed about feelings it. about it. I got mixed feelings about it, to be frank. Yeah, not, not about the protest that he, mm-hmm. he made because he, at all, because I my whole life curriculum and, and the, I'm sorry. What is it called when you're in uh, uh, grammar school? Mm-hmm. I got in trouble in grammar school and junior high for not standing because my mother told me I didn't have to. Mm. So I used to get sent to the principal, principal's, principal's office and they tried to suspend me and my brother, but they couldn't because it wasn't legal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know what this is, you know, and I would sit there, the whole class of 40 kids, I'd sit there and I would make enemies with certain people in the class because they thought I wasn't. Well, fuck you, Mm -hmm. you know. So I understand what he's, the statement there. But unfortunately for him, Colin, um, it's not that year where he was on fire. Mm. You know, you got to have the goods to deliver the message the proper way. Because look at Marshawn now. Exactly. You know. A (laughs) hundred percent. And by the way, he's a real punk rocker. I mean, he's real. I mean, he's real punk rock. And. That's my point. Like, he's such a unique individual performing at a high level like Muhammad Ali, okay, that the unfortunate thing with Colin is you're saying this now, but you're not performing at a high level. You're on the bench doing this, and it looks a little funny. I don't, I don't question his, mm-hmm. motive. his his motive at all because I don't think there is any. I don't think he's fronting, mm-hmm. but it's just unfortunate he's not performing at a high level. Mm. You know, or even, by the way, he's not even, he's not even in the league, right? No, they haven't picked him up yeah. yet. Okay. Well, hopefully well, he's hopefully he's doing something that uh, that any great person does, which is really working on his self and his game right now. So when he gets the opportunity, because he'll get an opportunity. I hope so. Um, that he's at a hundred percent and better than he ever was as an athlete and a man. You know. Yes. Yeah. We are uh, in studio with Alan. Hughes, one of the Hughes brothers. A um, uh, couple more questions. Um, you want to talk to my brother? You want to call him motherfucking prog? I, I miss your brother. I miss both of you guys together. So how is is it? Is there a big difference with working with him and then not working mm-hmm. with him? Is it? Do you feel the absence, or is it no. a different dynamic? It's a different dynamic. I don't feel the absence uh, at all. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I I feel I felt it. There's, there'll be a scene maybe like that I'm working on, like one scene, especially in the Defiant ones, where I was like, all right, that's I felt it in that scene where I go, I could, my yeah. brother, I know what he would do with this. Aww. But um, no, it's natural for him and for me, like you can't, 
you can't, you know, you know when when you're doing radio too. There's the main person, and mm-hmm. then if there's other people, but you got to have the, the the Tom Brady, the anchor. <laughs> you know, the quarterback. Yeah. And with directing, it's the same way. You, you know, the thing that most people don't realize that was interesting about Albert and I when we were the Hughes brothers is that when that cast or those actors and that camera department, when you yell cut, it's like a football. It's like a football team and a basketball team when they blow the whistle. All the players look to the sideline at the coach because they want to know what, that's the most important thing. The director's the coach. Mm-hmm. If you look on the sideline and you got Bill Belichick and another coach, big high end coach, half the teams on look at that one and half the teams on look at this. So it's a dysfunction. It doesn't work. Mm. You get, there's only one captain on the ship. So that's why I don't ever miss it. I miss collaborating with my brother. Mm-hmm. I don't miss directing with my brother. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, because I said it's kind of hard to have two directors. Yeah, it's, 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 it's stupid. Yeah. yeah. Um, one, two more questions. One, what kind of advice would you give young filmmakers out there um, on pursuing that, that road? And we'll get, I'll get your answer on that, and then we'll find out what's next for you. Young filmmakers, um, just, fi- just, 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 make film you know like we said earlier i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not just trying to blow this off like seriously like if you can do it on your iphone now so write the script write the short make it short make it something you can do don't be too ambitious Mm -hmm. and just make it and keep making it and keep making it and eventually if you're doing the right thing if you're if you're really playing your instrument well someone's going to hear it you know, you and you got to do the work to make sure they hear it as well whether Mm -hmm. it's partnering up with a a homeboy a homegirl Mm -hmm. that likes to market and they're they're into marketing but you know so just playing your instrument alone great is not going to get you there but play your instrument because you guys have entered your stuff into film festivals Mm -hmm. and stuff like that so once you get those short films and those shorts done Mm -hmm. is that a good way to get discovered yep Yep. okay 100 percent um what's next for you Mm, i don't know (laughs) what's next for me is um i'm going away to go work on myself and nature Okay. for 30 days okay and get all the poison out of my system and uh come to terms with uh uh come to grips with like all right what's the next 20 gonna look like i'm talking about creatively yeah you know and um there's a lot of like love out there right now i'm like wow i can't believe how how many people are so inspired and motivated in by the film the divine ones i didn't i didn't think people would be inspired is that going to be it, a yeah. series because they said season one I, I don't know maybe hbo knows something i don't know it's, it, it was my idea mm-hmm. um, because that could apply that could just be a whole series about yeah. trailblazers with similar stories are resilient to their yeah. rich rags to rich i mean yeah. that could be that could be a series you know anyone with a brain has been saying that they've really been saying that a lot and i go listen I'm not mad at that. That that if if HBO wants to do that, I think that. But you, know, you can't you take mean, four four years per. You can't do that. <laughs> for, no, per you episode. can't. There's a way you can you can uh, <laughs> right. you know um, what do you call it? Condense Mic- it. Condense it. Micro size. Make it into a a a, a, a meaningful uh, series in a business where you know whatever if they want to do that. I'm I'm all ears because it. it I didn't. I gotta tell you, I was surprised. I knew what I had, but I didn't know people would be inspired by it. Yeah. I had no idea. Dre knew that from the beginning, mm. and Jimmy knew that, but I didn't know that. I go, I, I was blindsided yeah, It was inspirational. Yeah. If I had to put one word on it, mm-hmm. I, it would be inspirational. Mm-hmm. Well, Alan, wow. I haven't seen you in years, and thank you so much for coming by our little radio station Look, in the dope, hood, yeah. right up the street from where you shot Menace to yeah, Society. Literally, like, we can walk to that stoplight where Harold got shot. <laughs> right. <laughs> and thank you so much, thank Alan. You. And come back and visit us again. When Don't you... be a stranger. I will not. Yeah. The air is great in this room, by the way. This shit works. The air conditioning <laughs> works in this motherfucker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank We've been you. talking to film yeah, director Alan Hughes on In the Booth with the Poetess. And we'll catch you next time. Peace.